Thank you. We are approaching lunchtime. And as a paleoanthropologist, I must apologize because I'm not speaking out about meat, but only on naked bones. <laughs> so the big question is always, where do we come from? And when we follow the speech before, I can clearly say that we are all Africans. We are working in the cradle of humankind. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site north of Johannesburg. And since 12 years, I'm working there with my students and with my colleague from the University of Witwatersrand, Lee Berger. And in 12 years, we found thousands and thousands of bones. But what we are expecting, finding some bones which tell us the story of the human evolution. And what we found during 12 years was one finger bone and two broken teeth of Australopithecus, a precursor of humans. So it's rather deceptive. But 2008, a big thing happened which changed our life. Because Lee discovered a new site and found some bones. Actually, we have about 190 bones of about four individuals, and we have two skeletons which are almost complete. More complete as the famous Lucy, you may know. And for the first time in Europe, you can see the cast of these fossils here. So how do we find these things? It's a tricky thing. And when we look at human evolution, it's a rather complicated story. We have a lot of fossils which are candidates to be our precursors. One group we can exclude. It's this green group on the right side of this table. These are paranthropus. These are very human-like forms which walked upright, which have human-like dentition, but they are so specialized that they are, in the beginning, uh, excluded from the ancestry of humans. These were superhuman forms, but real uh, chewing machines. And they were so specialized that with the change in ecological surroundings, that they disappeared. So there are other candidates which are also in line. You may hear about Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis. And these are also only a few pieces of dentition. We not, do not have pieces of the locomotor apparatus. And the locomotor apparatus, our movement, is so special that we consider all forms which walk bipedally upright as hominins, as human-like creatures. So these forms also are not very interesting. But the first form which showed this bipedal locomotion were the Australopithecines. He had problems to, spe <laughs> to speak about Australopithecines. It uh, means the ape from the south because the first specimen was discovered in South Africa. These are forms which are similar to upright walking apes, but they have a reduced dentition and they have a really transformed pelvic region, and we know they were bipedal. They have a lot of uh, characters which show that they climbed in the trees, and apparently they were vegetarians. And we have another group which originated about two and two and a half million years ago, and this is Homo, our genus. Homo has a completely different lifestyle because they have bigger brains and our brains are monstrosities. If we consider apes, they need about 10 to 15 percent of their daily energy to feed their brain. Humans have a big brain and we need about 25 to 30 percent of our daily energy to make this machine moving. And a child which is growing which grows their brain, needs 40 to 50% of the daily energy to make it growing and to make it functioning. So our brain is a monstrosity, and we need more energy. 
And we think that that was the moment that these forms changed their lifestyle. They started to eat high protein, high fat containing uh, food, and that's meat. They started to eat meat. They started to hunt. And the main character of Homo is that they are becoming uh, nomadic uh, hunters. So we have two different lifestyles which are explained by the genus Australopithecus and Homo. And our big question is how the transition from the vegetarian to the hunter took place. And we have no material. But now we think we may have an indication of this uh, trans, uh, trans, uh, yeah, this over go to another lifestyle. So how do we find this site? This is a typical place where we find fossils. In South Africa, these fossils are found in caves. And how do we find caves? It's very easy. Do you look in the landscape and then you see small patches of trees. And you see a patch like that. These are special trees, olive stinkwood. They grow in the entrance of caves. Because when the bushfire goes over the landscape, these trees are protected in the entrance of the cave. So we find these things. And these caves are very, very famous because in the last century, the miners went to the, into the cave to get the stalactite and the stalagmites. They were looking for calcite because the calcite was used in Krugerstorp nearby to extract the gold. So all these caves are mined for calcite. But unfortunately, for millions of years, these caves were also inhabited by animals, bats, owls, and carnivores. We have leopards, we have hyenas, until today. And they have their young in these caves, bring the food in the cave, and what we found now is just the rest of the meals of these carnivores. But for the miners, these bones and this dust was nothing. It was baked together by calcite, and they couldn't use it. So they used dynamite to explode these sediments and deposited the sediments in front of the cave. And what you see here are the students which are walking on this dump. And what we are doing, we are looking for fossils in these dumps. And when we are lucky, we find traces of fossils. Here you see a mold of a long bone, which some rests of the long bones. Apparently the stone was for years out of the cave, and that's why the erosion moved the bone away. And that's the way we find these things. But we use now modern techniques. We use now, as you heard before, Google Earth. Because we can depict these patches of trees on the map of Google. And you see how we are proceeding. And that's the reason why we found this new site. Lee was mapping possible sites, possible caves, and you see a pairing all these patches of trees where cave openings are. And so we are going through the landscape and map these caves, and from time to time we go and look if we can find fossils. And the last point you see on this cave, this is Malapa, my home place. And Malapa is this new site, and he mapped the sites, and on weekend he went out with his son and a few students and the dog, and were looking if there really were fossils. And the small boy found the first hominid bone. And when I called him, he said, we stopped Gladys Whale where we've worked for 12 years, I have a new site. And we started 2009 to dig there. These caves are solution caves by groundwater in these dolomitic uh, stones. And when the water tables goes down, these caves are opened, they are still wet. You have these dripping stones, the calcite, where the miners were looking for. And with erosion, we have openings. And then the animal can go in there. And finally, we have these rests of 
animal meat in there, and that's what we are looking for. So Gladys Vale is just a remnant of a cave like that, and you see the Swiss Field School cleaning the place, because the first thing we were doing, cleaning all the things. And every bucket of soil was sieved to find fossils. And my uh, students found a lot of very important fossils there. So the geologist can analyze the whole uh, series, and these green parts, these are the sediments where the fossils are found. And the most important one was found uh, in, the, in 2009. This was the skull of a young individual. It's now called Carabo. This is translated from Sutu, which means the answer. And we think it may be the answer for this uh, transitional state. So the geologist could date the calcite layer which lies below the sediments on two million years. Oh. And uh, we have, last year, we had new excavation and could uh, open another area where we find a calcite which is capping the whole thing. And we are now sure that our fossils are older than 1.977 million years. There are different dating methods to uh, organize it. How these fossils came into the cave, and that's a special thing, because apparently our bones were not the meal of carnivores. They fell into death traps. Higher up on the hill, we found, find these shafts where apparently the animals fell down. We found in Malapa a complete skeleton of a saber-toothed cat. We found a complete skeleton of an antelope. And we found two partial skeletons of hominid without traces of gnawing on it or something like that. Because they fell down and formed a debris cone. And with a big rain, apparently they were washed down in a sediment trap. And that's where we find our things. And these fossils are very complete. This is a scene which is imagined. It was a, a skip, sketch which were supposed to appear in National Geographic. And here you see Job Kibi. He is one of our core team. He is pointing on a small, uh, bright point. And if you look at this point, we see we have a piece of foam looking out. And that's what we are looking for. This is nothing else but the top of this bone reaching out of the block. We took the block into the lab, and the block was um, prepared. We used small air scribes, which are little hammers, and what was appearing was this bone. And in addition, you see a, um, a shoulder blade. And that was the first time where we found a complete shoulder blade, because the upper part was in another stone which were found about four meters away from this block. But it fits. And for the moment, we have the first complete shoulder blade of an Australopithecus. This is a crazy thing. It was never found before. And nobody else saw this complete one physically, as you see it, because we only isolated it with a computer, and I'm now in charge to reconstruct it, and all my colleagues didn't see it for the moment, so <laughs> I've never <really> met. <laughs> so that's my task. You see, more and more bones were appearing on it, and what you see here were all the rests which were in this block. We have the complete upper arm, and for the first time in the world, we have a complete lower arm. If you remember Lucy, these are fragments, and we don't know the length of this thing. And on the lowest part, we found some very special bones, which came out to be the first complete hand of a fossil like that. When we analyze the bones, we see that these arms are very long. You have a comparison. On the left side, you see a chimpanzee. On the rough, uh, right side, you see an ituri pygmy, a human. And humans have very short lower arms, whereas chimpanzees have very long arms. And so we have an ape-like arm. And the proportions could be somehow ape-like. 
In addition, we have these shoulder blades. Humans have shoulder blades which are different from apes because in humans, the clavicle is facing horizontally. Whereas in apes, the shoulder, the, these uh, clavicles are going up. The whole uh, joint is facing upward because they are hanging in the trees. And when we look at this shoulder blade, we see the lower part which looks like human. Although the muscle insertion are very much heavier. And all my colleagues said, yeah, these shoulder, bl shoulder blades are like humans. But they never saw the upper part. And if we look at the upper part, we see that the clavicle is in a position like in a chimpanzee. So it's an ape-like shoulder. And then we found these bones. This is a stage of preparation. And at the end, maybe you saw these pictures in the, in the medias now, we had this hand. And this hand is not an ape-like hand. The difference between ape-like hands and human hands is very clear. Apes have very long fingers, which are a little bit flexed because they have strong flexors. They have a short thumb and they hang with these fingers. They cannot stretch the fingers. They always have the fingers like that. And when they walk, because they cannot stretch the fingers, they walk on their knuckles. So it's very different. Whereas humans have very strong thumbs. And these thumbs have very complicated muscles here. In, uh, uh, in the language, they called it mouse. The little mouse, moischen. And the little mouse in Latin is musculus. And that's where the, the word muscle came from. It's this part. And this is a very complicated part. And this strong muscle and this strong thumb is very useful and is a pre-adaptation for making stone tools. So it's a very human-like hand. And we can measure the whole thing. We can measure... Oops, these, th <laughs> these thumbs. And you see, also, particularly Sidiba has a very human like hand. So, uh, when we look at the head, we also have a difference. We have in Australopithecus very strong chewing muscles, but uh, in our Sidiba, we have a very uh, human like skull. But the difference is we have a very small brain. So, we don't know where to sit these uh, uh, brains. And you see here, the human brain is, is very different, starting about 2 million years to become bigger. And our form must be somewhere here. So maybe now uh, we have a transitional thing. And we have, in addition, a pelvis which is very different. Because in Australopithecine, we, we have a pelvis where you see the movement is like waddling. But in humans, when they walk, the pelvis is held in a horizontal position. Because when we move, we have to hold our pelvis in a horizontal position to move the, uh, the leg. That's the reason why we are the only mammal which can play football. So uh, I'm uh, going over these characters, but the uh, pelvis is very human-like, and so we can... Uh, whoa, whoa, come on. <laughs> now, I don't say about something about the, the pictures, but these pictures you can see in National Geographic. So just... Uh, when we look at these skeletons, we have a small brain, we have ape-like shoulders, we have long arms and uh, ape-like thorax, we have a foot which is ape-like, so we can think it's an australopithecine. But when we look at the dentition, we have a human-like dentition, we have a human-like hand, we have a human-like pelvis, and that's why we think that Australopithecus sediba which has an age of two million years, sits in between these two different forms, and we think that is a transitional form. And that's our hypothesis, must be discussed. We are not sure if this posi position is right, but one thing is sure, that our two skeletons are shaking the human tree. Uh, thank you.